Uh, yeah, well, certainly the last couple of days and, mm -hmm. and how we ended last year. But I understand the market's desire to rally on expectations of Fed rate cuts. I mean, that's been the playbook for decades now. So I get why we rallied. Uh, I think earnings over the next couple of weeks are, are just in time in the sense of testing uh, the thesis that everything is fine. And there are just so many mixed signals within the global economy that it just can make your, your head spin. When you look at holiday sales, for example, you have Master Pulse, uh, the MasterCard spending pulse. You have the National Red Retail Federation saying that holiday sales were about 3.5%. Well, that's the rate of inflation. So on a real basis, holiday sales were zero. U.S. manufacturing, global manufacturing for that matter, are in a recession. You have the pace of existing home sales near 30-year lows, but home building doing okay. You have high-end spending on travel and leisure, hospitality, restaurants doing fine, but spending on stuff not doing well. And if you looked at the Beige Book last week, of the 12 districts, eight basically saw no growth. You had three that saw modest growth, one that saw a modest decline. That doesn't sound like a great economy. So it just, and then you look at overseas, Europe is essentially, essentially at best flatlining. China, we know, is further decelerating. So it's really a tough environment to both figure out and, and maneuver through. And I think the stock market is really trading off. The Fed is going to not be in our face anymore. And maybe even NQT, too, to throw that in there and just buy stocks because of that rather than a real analysis on the, on the full macro. Diving into 2024 feels like unraveling a complex story where the S&P 500 hits record levels, bouncing high without the usual boost from strong earnings. It's like we're in a world where the numbers look great on paper, but the reality isn't as shiny. It's as if we're celebrating wealth that might not be as solid as it seems. Take a look at the recent cheer from the National Retail Federation about retail sales jumping by 3.5%. But if you take a closer look, adjusting for inflation, the sparkle fades, revealing a truth that's hard to swallow. Sales aren't really moving up. They are stuck in place. It's like we're all optimistic, standing on ground that could vanish any moment. In the business world, manufacturing, which usually tells us how healthy the economy is, is teetering on the edge. In the housing market, it's moving at a pace we haven't seen in 30 years, signaling trouble that's hard to ignore. These warning signs suggest that the party on Wall Street might be out of sync with the real economy. Looking around the globe, the picture doesn't get any brighter. Europe, expected to be bustling, is barely moving. China, known for its economic might, is showing signs that it might slow down. These global hints are like whispers, telling us that the world's economy is facing hurdles despite the stock market's joy. As we sail through these uncertain times, the warnings are getting louder. The stock market's dazzling heights might be hiding weak spots that, if revealed, could shake the financial world. The year 2024 is a crucial junction, asking for careful steps and watchful eyes. Amidst the celebration of soaring market highs, one wrong move could lead to a steep and sudden drop. Well, I think that's an internal uh, debate within the Fed. Can they continue with QT because Jay Powell wants to get the balance sheet to a level that he's comfortable with, which he can't even define, actually, but at the same time sort of tweak monetary policy on the rate side to reduce the odds of a recession, but not cut too much that you stoke higher inflation again. And this is a very difficult situation that Powell's in. I think his main priority right now is not to stoke a flare-up in inflation. He thinks he's got a handle on it with the downside of the cyclical spike, but keeping inflation low is his next battle. And I, I think that's really going to be interesting to see how the Fed plays the balance sheet with what they do with interest rates. But even the interest rate story is a trade-off. If they only cut a couple of times, call that maybe just a tweak, and the Fed funds rate's still going to remain high. If they cut six times, seven times, that's because the unemployment rate's going to four and a half to five, and we're in a recession. So uh, it, it, this is not an easy situation to really analyze and from the Fed's perspective to actually maneuver through. In the complex world of economic decision-making, the Federal Reserve is caught in an ongoing debate about how to strike the right balance. 
They are juggling the need to tighten the purse strings while keeping enough wiggle room to maneuver. Fed Chair Jay Powell is in the hot seat, trying to figure out the magic number for their balance sheet, which is easier said than done. After the pandemic hit, there was a flood of money pumped into the economy, making things lively. This extra cash boosted the stock market and property prices, making investors happy. But now, with the Fed pulling back on the money reins, things are getting tighter, and that easy money is drying up. Investors were feeling pretty good, thinking inflation was old news. Yet, with inflation sticking around at 3.5%, way over the Fed's comfort zone of 2%, it looks like high interest rates are here to stay for a while. This mismatch is making things tricky for the economy and putting a damper on the stock market party. With the recession looming on the horizon, thanks to these tighter conditions and stubborn interest rates, the economic outlook is getting gloomy. It's odd to see the stock market hitting new highs when all signs are telling us to be careful. The situation makes the idea of investing in stocks less appealing. As cautious investors navigate these uncertain waters, keeping an eye out for any storms ahead. As the Fed tries to balance its monetary strategies, the financial world is at a pivotal point. The choices made now will shape the future, bringing together the lessons of the past with the unknowns ahead. In these uncertain times, being cautious is key, encouraging investors to move carefully in a world that might not be as rosy as the market highs suggest. I think this is going to take a few more years. Uh, this year, we have about $750 billion of corporate debt that needs to be refinanced. Now, granted, some of that took place in 2023, but that rises to over a trillion in 2025. You have about a half a trillion dollars of commercial real estate that needs to be refinanced. And, and I, I've spoken to just over the weekend to some real estate people that are just crossing their fingers that the 10-year yield goes down to 3%. Because if rates stay around these levels, with their debt coming due at the latter part of this year, they're in trouble. So I still think that this has many years to sort of work its way through the refinancing cycle. And uh, that is going to be a continuous drag on economic activity. Now, that said, when you look at those companies that borrow so for plus, well, if the Fed's going to cut, maybe they've seen the worst of it. A lot of small, medium-sized businesses do borrow floating rate. So uh, ironically, it could be the bigger companies that are going to see the jumps in interest rates. And we have to remember that one of the main contributors to profit margin expansion over the past couple of decades was lower interest expense. As we chart our course through the economic seas, these quiet storm brewing centered around the complex world of corporate debt and the tricky business of refinancing when money's getting tighter. This storm involves the dance of interest rates, economic ups and downs, and the company's financial commitments, all mixing together to potentially rock the stock market boat. Right now, corporate debt is stepping into the spotlight. As we move into 2024, we hit a critical point where around $750 billion in corporate debt is up for refinancing. This mountain of debt isn't getting any smaller. In fact, it's expected to climb beyond a trillion dollars by 2025. And let's not forget the commercial real estate sector, staring down the barrel of a half a trillion dollar refinancing challenge. Chatting with the real estate pros, you can feel the tension. Their future swings on the fluctuating 10-year yield with fingers crossed for a drop to 3%. If interest rates stick where they are, these businesses are in for a rough ride, struggling under the weight of their debt. This ongoing cycle of refinancing could put a drag on the whole economy, making things tougher for companies and shaking up the financial world. Smaller and mid-sized companies, often hooked on variable rate loans, are especially vulnerable. Interestingly, if the Fed starts cutting rates, it might actually be the big players that feel the heat from rising interest rates. This twist could shake up the usual story, showing that the fallout from the monetary policy doesn't hit everyone equally. A key factor behind companies' growing profit margins over the years has been lower interest costs. But as the storm picks up, rising interest rates threaten to chip away at this advantage, hitting companies right where it hurts, their profits. So, what's all this mean for the stock market? It's a big deal. This mix of debt dilemmas and economic headwinds calls for a lot of caution. Investors need to be mindful of the complex interplay between corporate debt and interest rates and how it might ripple through the businesses, big and small. As we edge closer to this debt storm, the stock market's strength is going to be seriously tested. 
we might see the economic fabric woven over the years start to fray, with each dead challenge adding another twist to an already complex situation. The storm's on its way, and its impact on the stock market could hit sooner than many think. Time to buckle up for the bumpy ride ahead. In the shadow of this gathering storm, with corporate debt and tight money painting a grim picture, it's time for investors to play it safe. The call of the day isn't for bold bets, but for shielding your assets. As the economic outlook gets murkier, two solid shelters stand out. Gold and short-term fixed income deposits. Gold shines as a trusty safe haven, a timeless refuge that holds its ground when economic storms hit. It's a bulwark against inflation, currency swings, and market jitters. Turning part of your portfolio to gold could provide a steadying force amid stock market turbulence. For those leaning towards caution, short-term fixed income deposits are a compelling choice. They offer a smooth ride with low risk, perfect for investors who prefer to keep things conservative when the economic weather looks iffy. Their short-term nature means you can stay nimble, ready to adjust your sales as the financial winds change.